<sighs> I'm a microbiologist. Which means I get to do some pretty cool stuff. And recently I've been part of an amazing project which gave me the opportunity to discover a entirely new phage or virus if you are a normie. And this is basically just a fancy little phage that infects MSMEG or Mycobacterium smegmatis, which is a bacteria that lives in the soil. And MSMEG has been used in research in the past for things like tuberculosis or leprosy both of which are not very pleasant to be afflicted with. So by doing my own research, maybe I could find something else. Because MSMEG is found in the soil, we have to get soil samples and then flood them with something called enrichment broth. Enrichment broth is nothing like the broth your mother makes. Rather, it's just a bunch of nutrients which facilitate the growth of bacteria and viruses inside of the solution. So we're praying that we have bacteria and a phage inside of the soil sample. So we're going to brew it up and make sure that there's plenty of it so then we can work with it more. Because sure, maybe you have one or two, but that's not enough to really get a positive result later on. So we gotta put it in something called a shaker. Yes, we scientists are very good at naming things. The shaker does exactly what you think it does. It shakes things. So we're gonna put it in the shaker, have it shake it for an hour, pull it out, and then put it in the centrifuge, which is this funny little machine that spins stuff really, really fast. And we're gonna spin it at 1,000 Gs. For reference, the average human can survive between four and six Gs. So, you know, these phage are really packing a punch. After it's done spinning, we've basically separated the gunk to the bottom, and we have this nice mixture of broth, phage, and bacteria, and hopefully nothing else, in the top. So we're then going to filter it out, make sure there's no particulates, and we have a relatively pure sample. We're then going to work with this sample by adding more MSMEG into it to make sure that it didn't accidentally die when it was spun around like crazy. And we're going to put it in the shaker for two days. There's a lot of waiting in this process, you'll see. After the two days are up, we're going to pull out our sample and put it into these itty bitty little micro centrifuge tubes, which can only hold like a milliliter each, so we don't actually need that much. And we're going to spin them up to remove even more gunk from it because it's very possible that there was more in the process, such as all the dead bacterial cells, which we do not want and will hopefully fall to the bottom. We're also gonna prep something called an agar plate. If you've played the game Agario, then you've probably actually been introduced to this concept before. An agar plate is basically just a material called agar and bacteria grows on it. So in the game, you're a bacterium eating other things on an agar plate. Also, don't mix this up with a petri dish. A petri dish is just a dish. It's just the actual plate. You put agar in the petri dish to make an agar plate. And this agar specifically has calcium added to it because calcium makes the phage extra happy and it grows even more. So we gotta make a bacterial lawn, which is basically mixing up MSMEG and agar with calcium and making this nice little flat surface with bacteria. This gives us a good understanding if there will be phage or not, because remember that purified sample I put in the micro centrifuge? We're gonna take the top part, which is hopefully has some phage, and we're gonna dip it into half of the plate. We're just gonna put little itty bitty drops. On the other half, we're gonna put phage buffer, which is just a simulation of the exact same environment as the phage, except there is no phage. This gives us the concept of negative control. Negative control basically tells us, hey, this is what it looks like when you don't have phage. So what's the point of then making a negative control? Well, imagine the plate gets contaminated or there happens to be another type of bacterium in there. It would infect the entire plate so we would see that there's also a positive result on the negative control, which shouldn't happen, meaning you did something wrong. Don't underestimate negative control, kids. We had a whole contamination of the lab and I didn't use negative control, so I didn't know that I was screwing up for two weeks. And then we're going to basically take this plate and put it in the incubator for another two days, hopefully seeing some phage growing on that other side. Keep in mind that up to this point, we have no idea if we even have phage. We're praying and hoping that that sample actually has phage in it and yielded a positive result, which we'll see after the two days are up. That's why I wasn't exactly working with just one soil sample. In fact, it would take me eight samples to get a phage. And voila, our plate is positive. You see that little speck right there? Well, that basically says that there's actually dead bacteria because the bacteria would grow consistently flat on the plate, but where it's missing, there's a virus killing it. So that means that we have phage there. And then we're gonna do something called plaque picking because the term plaque doesn't just refer to the gunk on your teeth and the thing you get for hitting 100,000 subscribers. You should subscribe by the way. 
but it also actually means the area on a plate where this stuff is dead, meaning that there is phage. So we're going to pick it and hopefully scrape off some phage. Not hopefully, there's definitely. I mean, this stuff's really concentrated, all right? And we're going to dip it into more phage buffer. We're gonna swirl it around and do something fancy called a serial dilution. A serial dilution is essentially where you're going to be taking a sample that is 10 to the zero, which is one, if you actually paid attention in math, and then slowly take a 10th of that, so 10 to the negative one, and a 10th of that, and a 10th of that, and a 10th of that, basically making it smaller and smaller and smaller until we can hopefully isolate a single colony of phage. Why do we want to do this? Well, first of all, we actually don't want genetic diversity. And second of all, we want to make sure that there's only one phage in the sample. It's very possible that there's two types of phage killing the bacteria here. We want to make sure that we're only working with one. Usually we basically played it down to like a 10 to the negative five, because at that point, you're not going to get any spots. And then you're going to run it back into the incubator for two more days, pull it out and see what you got. And guess what? You're going to try to find the smallest, most isolated and not contaminated colony. And then you're going to do the exact same thing three more times. You're going to plaque pick and do a serial dilution. Plaque pick, serial dilution, plaque pick, serial dilution. Well, on the last one, you're going to find something called a webbed plate, which is basically a plate where the phage has killed all of the bacteria, or at least most of the bacteria, on the plate, and you're going to flood it with phage buffer. This stuff is going to make the perfect environment for the phage to grow even more and have a nice concentrated sample. We're going to remove this after two hours are up and filter it to make sure that there's not any dead bacteria parts in it, but just phage. And no, this isn't pure phage. I mean, it's as close as we're gonna get, but it isn't. It's actually called lysate. Look it up. And we're not done because now we have to calculate the concentration of our lysate and figure out exactly how much phage per microliter we have in here. And how do we do that? You're right, serial dilution. We have to do another serial dilution, but we're gonna do it to an extremely small amount because we don't know how concentrated it is. So all the way down to 10 to the negative 11. And then we're going to see the one that has between 20 and 200 spots. And I was lucky enough to get one where I basically had to count 200 spots. Yeah, but it gives us a basic idea because then you can take the concentration and the number of spots or plaques on your plate, plug them into this fancy little equation and calculate your titer. Your titer is just another way of saying the amount of stuff in this stuff or concentration. If your titer is good enough because there is a specific threshold, you can do the next step. If it isn't, <laughs> uh, you're screwed. You basically can't do anything. I mean, you have to pray that you can get a higher concentration by maybe having it sit longer in the lysate, but in the most parts, you have to throw away your entire project and start anew. I was dumb enough to not actually filter my lysate because I don't like reading and following instructions. And so it sat there for two weeks because we were on break and I came back to an extremely concentrated sample. Um, which, you know, it was pretty convenient. So now that we have the green light to do DNA extraction, let's get that on the way. We're basically going to take our lysate, which I'll remind you has dead bacteria in it, because sure, the filter works, but it doesn't work perfectly, and phage and some other stuff in there. And we're going to add nuclease. Now, if you took biology or chemistry in high school, then you're probably familiar that the fact that it ends with ace means it's an enzyme and you're absolutely on the money. Nuclease basically attacks nucleotides, or DNA and RNA, and destroys it. So this is gonna destroy all our DNA. But why do we wanna destroy our DNA if that's what we're trying to get, right? We wanna extract phage DNA. Well, the dead bacteria cells have DNA too, and they're gonna be destroying that. But because the phage has this fancy thing called a capsid, which is just a shell of proteins protecting the DNA on the little tip, it's actually going to protect it from the actual nuclease which from there we're going to put it in the incubator for 10 minutes and have it actually degrade the proteins, breaking down the capsid. And after the 10 minutes are up, we have to quickly rush to add EDTA. This stuff is basically going to calm down the nuclease and protect the actual nucleotides. So it's a race. Who's gonna get there first, the nucleus or the EDTA? And we have to pray that the EDTA gets there in time because otherwise you have to redo this whole process again. And you don't know if you've screwed up or not until the very end because you actually can't see the DNA, right? You just see some solution of some liquid. So now we have to add something called DNA resin. This is not like the resin found on trees. Rather, it's just a mixture of a solution with beads in it. Yes, beads. These beads essentially bind to nucleotides or the DNA. And this is gonna be very useful in the future, you'll see. But we gotta make sure that they bind to all the DNA or at least most of it. So we have to shake it for two minutes. And no, we can't put it in the shaker because these actually have to be manually inverted. So I have to sit here and shake it for two minutes. Man, I love science. 
thank goodness those two minutes are up. Now we're gonna take something called columns, which are just these little chambers, and we're going to basically pipe the entire solution through a certain amount of columns. We don't want too much in one, otherwise we can't exactly clean it up. The columns inside have a special chemical that is going to bind to the beads. And because the beads have binded to the DNA, by extension, they are also holding on to the DNA. All the other gunk is going to flood through, but it might actually be caught somewhere. So we need to make sure to actually fully clean it up. So we're going to run through a little bit more of isopropyl alcohol, which is going to disinfect it and clean it all up. We're gonna do this like three times. And while we're doing this, we're pushing at an extreme amount because we actually have a vacuum in there. So it's going to hurt your hands and speed run carpal tunnel. And the output we put into a single flask, which you're supposed to call trash, but I like to call it apple juice. So you're done filtering it out, now what? Well, we actually gotta spin it a few times to make sure there's any isopropyl alcohol stuck inside the chamber. And once that's done, we're going to heat it up in a little heating block. This is basically just a fancy machine that heats stuff up. There's nothing more to it. Although we gotta make sure we don't hold it in there for too long because this is actually going to break the bonds between the beads and the nucleotides, but we don't want them to actually break the bonds in the DNA. So if you hold it there for maybe more than a minute, your DNA is gonna start denaturing. So we're gonna quickly pull it out and we're gonna pipe hot water through there, which is going to flush out all the DNA because it's actually not gonna break the bonds between the beads and the actual chamber, but it will actually just clean up all the DNA nice through the little hole at the end. We shall put it into the microcentrifuge tube and boom, you have pure phage DNA. Yes, there's some water, but we need to figure out exactly how much DNA we have based on this concentration. So now we basically have to run it through a mass spectrophotometer. Yes, that's a real vocab word there for you. This thing basically shoots rays of light and tries to figure out how they bounce back to determine the amount of concentration of things inside of the solution. So we're gonna pipe one microliter into this thing, shoot rays of light at it, and then understand how much stuff we have. It's gonna be give us a goofy uh, graph because we can't exactly understand what this graph says. So this graph is basically telling us that there is an amount of proteins or something that are pretty, pretty small, but not exactly DNA. But then that bump right there is basically telling us that boom, you've got DNA right there because that's the size that DNA takes. So maybe it's not pure, but if you're getting something like 300 nanograms per microliter, hell yeah, you're ready for the next process. So now that we have this relatively pure form of phage DNA, what are we gonna do with it? Well, we're gonna do gel electrophoresis, which is the really fancy way of saying running stuff through a gel, because that's the actual term we scientists use. You're basically gonna take more agar. And remember how I said that agar has to be melted? Well, this stuff is rock solid. So we're going to use the most scientific instrument that we have in the whole lab, a microwave. And we're gonna nuke this thing in there for like 40 seconds, pull it out, burn our hands because this thing is scalding hot and pour it into this weird bin. This thing is going to solidify. We're gonna add these little combs in there to make holes. These holes are where we're going to pipe in our solution later. Then we're gonna put something called TAE, which is basically just a buffer that lets stuff move through the gel so we can identify its concentration. But Michael, you only really have one DNA sample. What's the point of piping so many things? We're gonna add something called restriction enzymes, and these are stuff that cut up the DNA. And because we know exactly where they cut, we can get an understanding of kind of what type of phage it is, because different types of phage react differently to different restriction enzymes. So for instance, if you only get cut by one of this specific type, well then you know that you're probably gonna be a B type. But if you get cut maybe 15 times, you're gonna be a C type. We also have to add dye so we can actually see what we're piping because otherwise we don't exactly know if we're screwing up or not. And we're gonna run this through for about 30 minutes. And because it has different polarity of current on each side, it's actually gonna slowly move through the gel and give us an understanding of concentration. We also added something called a ladder, which basically separates the different concentrations and it acts almost like a ruler to give us an understanding like, okay, well this one moved this far down, so it has to be almost like this one. We're gonna do a few more gels because there's a lot of restriction enzymes out there. And this is kind of what they look like. They look way cooler than they actually are. Trust me. And now that we know that how they respond to all these restriction enzymes, we can basically determine, compared to other sequence genomes, what they're gonna look like. And we're done. That's it, that's the whole process. Boom, you found a phage, you figured out as much information as you can for it, it's ready to get sequenced. Hi, editor Michael here. Basically, at this point in the video, I was completely wrapped up with talking about the phage process, and I would have left it at that. But in the week after the recording of this, I had actually decided to commit to another project. You see, in the class, we had to do a presentation about our phage and me not taking anything seriously, decided to do a over top stereotypical ad that made absolutely no sense. Um, so if you want to check that out, it is actually in the iCarts and in the end screen theater of this video. Please give it a watch. I poured way too many hours into it and it's just a nice little laugh. 
also subscribe. Anyway, that's everything. Thank you so much for watching to the end. You're a real champ if you did. Also, YouTube has this really cool feature now where if I say the word subscribe, it actually makes the button glow. And if I say like, it does the same thing there. So why don't you put it to the next step and actually click those things and see what happens. I'll catch you in the next one.